Well, let me ask you a simple question. How did you get into the world of gaming? So I started um, actually back in school. It was one of those perfect situations where I said, can I go into the computer room, please? And they said, no, you're too young, which if anything, just makes you want it more. So when I finally got my foot in the door, they showed me the computers and I, and in those days you had to program everything your, yourself. There wasn't, it wasn't like there was a console I could play. And so, so we'd literally start typing things in and you very quickly realize the more fun stuff is the stuff that's got some game aspect to it. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, I, I can't even begin to tell you how basic these games are, but anything even going directly, you know, in the direction of a game is way more interesting than just something that's, that's uh, you know, homework related or something like that. So, mm -hmm. so you could see us, all of us slowly drifted into, into games. And what you did was in those days, because you were typing the games in, you learned how they actually worked. So you would see lives equals three, and you would think to yourself, hmm, I wonder if I put lives equals 10, will that work? And the answer is yes. And so the more you edited and manipulated the game, the more you learned how it actually worked. And it's a little, I feel sad for people today that when they just buy games, they never get to see under the cover. They never get to see how they work. And uh, ah. it was just a very fortunate thing being early. That's just how it was done back then. It sounds like even then you were interacting with other sort of geeks. Like the, the myth of the lonely gamer doesn't hold true. Even for your experience, you started and it sounds like you were collaborating with people or you were excited with peers about this. Yeah, the, it turned out that it was a lot of people heading the same way. We did still retreat to our bedrooms and, and do our programming until two in the morning. Mm -hmm. What happened to me was I got a, a check one day in the mail for $600. And I remember at the time going, my goodness, I don't even have a bank account. I don't know what to do with this check. And uh, of course it all turned into candy. That's, that's what you do when you're, when you're young and you get a big check like $600 that. $600 worth of but, candy, but wow. Th but then I'm like, what? I mean, you could make money doing this. And so that's what I started to do. And, and I'm doing that really alone because you didn't, in, in, in the very beginning of the industry, you didn't need an artist because there wasn't really art. It was pixels, you mm -hmm. know, like our blocks. So you're, you're, you would draw on graph paper and that was good enough. There was no animation really. You were the letter, I did games before the graphics, you were the letter V, <laughs> you know, and you're killing something else, the letter A. Um, so, you know, cause it looked like it had legs. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of, you didn't need an artist and, and sound was just a beep or no beep. So you didn't need a musician. So you could see how one person could forge along. Uh -huh. But what happened is someone else would have a bit of a breakthrough like they would work out how to detect really quickly if things collide. And so that's where the sharing would happen as people start to, to make the code better and better and better. So the more uh, variation that you could contribute to the game, the more, it, the more it required collaboration perhaps. Exactly, and then very quickly game graphics got better. Yeah. Music got better and suddenly you were found out that you couldn't draw at all. I mean, I, I was, I'm like, I can't even do good stick figures. So at some point I just had to get an artist yeah. and the minute you actually needed a musical scale, I, I was out and uh, I had to find myself a musician. So that's, then it became, it became all about the team. The team was everything. And, uh, and that, that was quite rapid. It's a bit amazing, but though I remember teaming up with my first guy, his name was Nick Brody, and the two of us were working in my mother's bedroom for years to today where you see 200, 300 people working on a game. It's almost hard to define all the jobs. There's so many. Um, because people are now specializing in so many little um, niches. You know, like I'm just doing the lips for the game. <laughs> it's right. like really the lip guy. <laughs> right, the blood. Oh, actually, I need someone else. There's so much lips to do. We're going to need to get another, like an assistant lip guy. And it's like, really? <laughs> and that's kind of the way the industry is evolving. Do you reminisce for the simplicity of the old days or it is what it is? I find a very interesting thing that happens in the business is somehow we keep resetting. So it feels like um, we're on this exponential curve, but then a new device comes out and like mobile phones and suddenly people, uh, I mean, we had mobile phones, but suddenly yeah. you could put a real sort of game on there. In fact, you remember the first ones, they were kind of text-based too, right? On yeah. the very first phones, they were very basic games. 
like you'd play chess by typing in the coordinates of the pieces, for example. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that's what happens is it all resets and, and you know, suddenly mobile developers are two people again. And, and of course, mobile games get bigger and bigger and bigger and the teams expand. Then something comes back and resets it again. And that's what I found quite interesting. Um, you know, it's, it's giving everyone a chance again to, to, to sort of come back and give it another try. But I, I do yearn for the days when I programmed. And today when people make games, they make them within big impressive engines. And they're writing them in, in languages like C and C++. So that they're not actually really programming the hardware anymore. They're programming, you know, outside of the, or sort of in an envelope that, mm -hmm. that, that is safe and, and secure and they can debug easily, et cetera. In the old days, if anything went wrong, it was your fault because you were in charge of the entire piece of hardware because you wrote, you wrote an assembly language. So you're actually programming in the code the machine was based upon. And if you wanted to move your game somewhere else, you had to completely rewrite it to, to move to the next machine. So those times have changed, but... Um, so um, I don't know anything about the world, but so are you basically saying there's sort of, nowadays there's existing protocols that you can just attach yeah. uh, modifications to, which will make your game a reality, but the, the guts of it, you don't have to create anymore. Yeah, you make it one time. Well, you make it, there's the, the, the main engine that does all the 3D and everything. Yeah. Somebody else wrote that. You don't even have to worry about that anymore. Mm -hmm. And then the, the core game, once you've written it, you can recompile it for any platform. And uh, that is fantastic. I mean, it's the best thing ever for a developer. It makes so much sense. But I still yearn for those days when you were completely responsible um, for every single line of code and every single problem was yours. Mm -hmm. I just, I don't know. I, so I, I kind of, I kind of hope that someday when we have another reset, we'll go back to assembly language where you can get to uh, completely control things. Well, let, me, let me ask you a question then. So say tomorrow you wake up and you have an idea for a game, mm -hmm. astronaut needs to eat peanut butter on the moon, whatever that great game. Great yeah. game. Uh, in a simple way, how do you go about, what do you worry about when you come up with that idea? Like if it's uh, big enough or if it's fun enough, yeah. or do you just pursue a whim? Like, screw it, I got free time, I'm gonna make a dumb game. And then that point to like execution or marketplace. I know this is a huge question, but no, broad it's, strokes. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. The, Thank you. The thing is that what I've learned is you need, there's too many games now. There's just, there's literally thousands of games every year released. Um, so at some point you have to have a hook and the hook can sometimes be like a brand that they recognize, like, you know, you're making another Tetris game or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, they, they know it, or Call of Duty. But if you're gonna make something that you're designing that's brand new, I think it needs a gameplay hook. And, and that is filter number one for me. If there's no gameplay hook, then you don't really wanna get started on this yet. Because when you work out what the hook is, and the hook means some feature that- So give me an example of a gameplay hook from a game that's been around. Well, like, well a game we, we did a game years ago called MDK. And in that game, we, um, we wanted to let you see farther. So in all games before that, you would just be able to see where you can normally see. But we mm -hmm. wanted to zoom in across the world and see a guy a mile away and then shoot him right in the eye from a mile away. And that invented sniper systems. But the, the minute you've invented a sniper system, then you have a hook that Got you it. know people are gonna be excited about. They've never done this before, but then you build the whole game around it. So it, it, it. it's inspiring lots of new ideas. So lots of situations start showing up that didn't ever show up before because they're inspired by the hook. I think that's the most, uh, that's, that's one solution. The second solution is you can take something that's been done before but just add a little bit of humor to it. That's like almost a secret. So it, there's, there's plenty of catapult games out there where you can catapult and destroy things. And I'm sure you've played lots Angry of Birds. them. Angry Birds? No, but Angry Birds comes along and makes it a little bit humorous, uh, right? So it's, it's not like you couldn't throw stuff and knock stuff over before Angry right. Birds, but they just added style and humor yes. to it. And um, a little bit of story, not even, it's not even much story no. to Angry Birds, but there's, there's something, it's not just the catapult game, right? Right. And I think that uh, that's a little secret is the there's so so little humor in games that if you sprinkle any on it can add an awful lot. So will you beat out uh, a story then? I understand the hook. I understand like uh, revitalizing and reinvigorating something that may have existed with a funny sense of humor or certainly a sense of why it's funny. But if you're creating a game from scratch, do you have to map out the whole world or the whole story? 
Or once you have the hook, you'll just start winging it and figure out what, what, what's needed. I think I've seen every stage of this where we've, we used to think we had to tell the whole story. So we used to, and, and the people writing the story would be people like me who are, I'm not a writer. So this is a guaranteed bad idea, um, <laughs> which means you've seen a lot of video games where you'll see a guy riding in a horse and a, a sword being held in the air and something happens over here. And there's just, there's no story. It's just random scenes mm -hmm. like a, a, from, and, and that's just how it was done. Then uh, when you get someone who knows how to write, that can become incredibly compelling. But the more they write, the more linear the whole thing becomes because mm -hmm. they, they, they kind of, you're going on their journey whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're going to drag you through it whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. And I think gamers are starting to rebel against it a little bit. They want, it's my adventure, I want it to be about me. And if anything, I think that opens up a world of new hooks that you could invent to try to give that feeling of complete freedom. And that means like in a lot of video games today, when you walk up to someone in a town, they'll say, welcome to town traveler. And then you pull a gun on them and they say, welcome to town traveler. And, and you go, wait a minute. And, and you know, maybe you just killed everyone in town and you walk over to them, the last man standing, and they'll say, welcome to town traveler. And you go, dear, oh dear, there's room for improvement here. And so I think that's really the point is people rush off and start writing the story and they'll forget about the story that's a, that you're really leading because you mm -hmm. really are leading it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I think there's a lot of room for innovation left. So the great news is after all these years, we're nowhere near done yet. So is there just an incredible amount of testing these things? Like, like to discover that flaw inside the game, like say you have basic code up and you can actually interact with the, the software. Is that a huge part of your development? Like do you, how long does it take to test out a game and find the flaws? It's a, it's a and... great question. We, we used to do our own testing because there was no such thing as testing teams. Mm -hmm. So it meant it got minimal testing because we played the way we played and that right. was that. Then along came professional testing teams where you would have a focus whole group, group of people, focus testing as well. Um, and that, that's that been going on for quite a while. Nowadays, people are getting a little more, hmm, this has to be kind of perfect because there's going to be millions of people playing. So we can't quite just have eight people play. Like in the old days, it was one and that's eight or 10 or 12. That's still not enough. I need like thousands. And so they've gone in two, there's two different forks that are happening. One is a lot of open, open testing, open beta, closed beta. You're hearing of these things. Closed beta means that, that only if we invite you. So it's a limited number. Open beta means everyone's welcome to give it a try but be aware this isn't finished yet mm -hmm. if you find a bug it's it's beta mm -hmm. um, but what's actually happening now is there's an awful lot more um, testing done by computer so imagine you don't have time you've just changed something significant in the game like you changed the distance you can jump you know that that could break in 50 million different ways right so what they'll do is they'll have actually an algorithm run through and jump 40 million times you know, over a seven day period, like a, a, just literally an algorithm testing you jumping against every square inch of the entire game from every angle, um, wow. trying to jump out of the world or to fall out of the world or get through the floor. Ah. You know, like they're trying to find these little minuscule little holes or errors that a normal small crew of testers are just never going to find. And that just gives you a much more robust game, but that takes compute. So either you're going to set up lots of servers in your offices or, or um, I, I'm expecting to see a lot more servers in the cloud that uh, do that kind of testing for you. But that's going to make games hopefully in the future a lot more stable. Well, let me ask you a, a moral question. Do you think video games contribute to any social ills that are currently sort of uh, problematic for, say, America? We'll speak about this country. Yeah, no, I, I think of, of video games, honestly, as just another form of entertainment. It's not, it's really not anything else. It's, it's a form of entertainment. Some people throw each other on a golf course or they go and fight and you know and because they're playing they're into boxing or whatever but in video games um there's one problem which is anonymity and i think that's one of the one of the more the more challenging parts of the industry imagine what do you mean? well imagine you're playing tennis with somebody but they don't know who you are mm -hmm. and you can say anything you want and they can't get to you that's that's a that's that's one of the fundamental things that i think gaming um, is suffering from a bit is just people being able to say what they like without any sort of price to them whatsoever. 
I think that's going to change. You're seeing much better um, social systems. I was watching someone play Battlefront and I was watching him on Twitch playing um, as a stream from a PlayStation and lots of people were watching and you could just see him going, I don't like your attitude, I'm blocking you. And it's the more, the easier, he's doing that while he's playing the game. Are the people I, watching him able to like send yeah, him messages? Yeah, they're all commenting and there's, okay. there's one guy who So was he just, can kick them off. Just or boom, gone. Okay. And, uh, and so that's ultimately, the, the better the systems become for managing these griefers or these people that are just there to annoy and irritate, mm -hmm. um, I think ultimately things get better. But no, overall, I just think of games as entertainment. Well, how about things like, and I don't know your work, but how about things like portraying women poorly or stereotypes or brutal, horrific violence? Do you have any opinion on those things when you create a game? Yeah, no, I, I definitely believe that, that um, you know, socially we have a responsibility, so I'm not a fan of doing ultra-violent games. Um, the good news is that the industry, thankfully, is policed by their sales. And that's something just to feel a little bit confident on. There's been people tried to make some really violent, because it's like writing a book. I can write any book I want, mm -hmm. um, but Barnes & Noble won't stock it, you know, if, mm -hmm. it, if it gets too crazy. And that's what happens in the game industry, is if you made something that was really bad and people really shouldn't be seeing, there's no retailer is going to stock it. Sure. And if they accidentally stocked it, there would be letters coming in from from parents five minutes later, and, and and that's happened where they're they just don't even they still think like a certain game is just a little too violent. So you run this incredible risk of of it being taken off the shelves, but you have to always remember that this is a global industry. This is not an American industry. Right. There's lots of other countries which are way more sensitive than the United States that censor very aggressively, and uh, and in those countries you'll lose their sales. So you know, meaning the whole country will not be buying your game. And that's not good either. So if you're, if you're designing a game right now and you're thinking, I'm going to make the most violent game ever, I would recommend that. So when you look at the sales you just lost um, or the fact that you might almost have no sales once you get it taken off the shelves, mm -hmm. it kind of polices it to some extent by itself. The other thing so is... So the sweet spot is basically appealing to human common sense rationality. Yeah. Yeah, in, it sort of, it sort of takes care of itself, but yeah. I will say it is really important that we continue to promote the rating system that exists. So we have a good rating system. All games are rated, and you, you have no choice. When your game comes out, you have to go through the, the ratings board, the ESRB. And when those guys, when they give you a rating, they need your help because we want parents to learn what those symbols mean, like an M is mature. We have to keep sort of drilling that into parents that... If you're if you have a if you're on a, a ten year old and they're playing an M rated game, that's not good. So you need to keep an eye on that. But that's the parents' responsibility. And as you know, it's a bit like going to the movies. Some parents are a little more lax. You know, maybe they can see a PG, maybe they can see a PG thirteen. My personal wish is that everyone would just agree on one system, all media. But I don't know if that'll ever happen. Oh, so movies so, and games would be on the same sort yeah, of. Yeah, I don't like that there's a, there's a PG over there and then there's something different over here. But but it, that it, could happen actually because it is all sort of merging, isn't it? Yeah, really? so the entertainment. And it the... would certainly remove a lot of the excuses from parents, like oh, I didn't know that. Uh, but anyway, if they're playing video games, my recommendation is they take the time, go online, and just look at what the ratings mean. And how long has that rating system been around? Forever or? Pretty much forever. I mean, yeah, it's been around. Been like around. there's no game you're going to see on the shelves for, for a console that you can't, uh, you can't tell what the rating is. Do you think uh, video games are addictive? Video games are, um, are incredibly addictive. And I mean, when I say addictive, I mean like really, really good games are very addictive and there's, there's lots of studies on why that is and um, it's, the, the twist is some of the research that I've read actually ties it up to things like mountain climbing where you can get into a certain state of mind where when, when you're climbing you get into that where you're, you're trying to get to somewhere, you know where you're trying to get to, you know it's going to be hard, it's going to take a lot of work and you just get into the state of mind of I'm going to get there. Finish it. 
And there's a general rule, which is you have to see where you are in relation to your goal. So if, if you see the top of the mountain, every, hand, every time I pull with my hand, I see the top of the mountain get a little closer. You'll keep going. It's when you get lost in the fog and you're tired and you don't know where the top is and it could be a long way still is when people become despondent and give up. So addictive video games tend to be very good at letting you see where you are in relation to something you're trying to achieve and letting you see, yep, you're a little closer, yeah, you're a little closer. And that's, that's, one of the, that's one of the things that causes that addictive loop. I think it applies to too to like uh, binge watching Netflix shows. Exactly. Because you is. do want to know, oh, I got you five know where more you episodes. Are, well, you know where you are in relation to, to the end of this episode and then they throw a cliffhanger at you and now you know, well, I'm only 40 minutes from the end of that episode. And so you can, you can sort of work it out in your head. Do you ever worry about people spending more time in the virtual world than the real world? I gave a speech once at TED and uh, a student, Michael Highland, had sent me a, or handed me a DVD at some point. I must have bumped into him somewhere. And I, I gave my speech and I, I showed some of his video um, that was on that desk simply because it was so amazing to see a kid really asking himself that question because he had driven more miles in virtual worlds than he had in the real world. Okay. So the question he was asking himself was, did I learn how to drive cars in a, in, the, in a video game? Because all the cues for driving had been taught to him before he ever sat in a real car. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I think when virtual reality comes, there's going to be a moment which I've experienced. It's, it's basically the future of VR is where you get to a point where you cannot distinguish reality from from what you're seeing inside so you, you think you're there you, for a moment you're just i'm absolutely certain i'm there when you get that experience it's going to cause a lot of game designers to stop building reality like if i could build los angeles in vr that's not so interesting as building somewhere you've never been before so it's going to cause everyone to get a little more creative instead of trying to copy something uh -huh. that's pre-existing take me somewhere i've never been before someone and and it's going to be a, an interesting challenge but once you get to that place if it is awesome i don't think you're going to want to leave so quick and so i do expect people to to get you know, they're going to arrive in their hotel room somewhere in some hotel and they're going to literally get their VR headset on and just get out of that hotel. Like, I don't want to be here right now. I want to be somewhere else. And you're going to have that option. And, and as the VR technology keeps improving, it's going to become more and more realistic. So, yeah, I, can ex I, I think it's going, to, it's going to change education. It's going to change a lot of things. Um, and I, I'm quite excited by that. Do you, do you not have any worry about interaction between people? Actually, it's going to lack of. no. It will improve um, interaction between people because imagine you're a father and you have a son who's now ten states away, mm -hmm. um, and you're sitting in that hotel room and you he puts on his headset and you put on yours and you're now having a shared experience where you you really feel like you're together. Mm -hmm. You're flying in an airplane together. You're going on missions together. You can talk about it when you get back home, but for that that time you're really together, that they'll have shared viewing as well, where you, you can watch movies um, sharing a sofa and literally you'll see them sitting in the sofa beside you. It's much better than, not ha than, than a text, hey, I love you, um, I'll see you tomorrow. That's mm -hmm. today's communication. This is just that on a whole new level. So it won't, it won't replace the urge for me to connect with my son? No, I and think- it, Will it replace the urge for people to say experience nature? Like if I can make a kick-ass Yellowstone and I'm under the waterfall and I'm wearing goggles. Do you worry about things like that? No, I've seen people actually working on this and they're trying to help. There are kids that are stuck in certain neighborhoods that will never see Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. They will never ever go out into the forest. They don't know the animals that are out there. They think it might be scary because they've seen it in a movie that it's scary. Mm -hmm. um, so there's people that are like, no, come and have a look at the nature and you'll see, you know, literally you can roam through the forest and see the animals and the flowers and everything. But the thing is that when you look at the flower, it can tell you what it is. And, uh, you know, when you look at the animal, it'll tell you all about the animal. So there, it's experiential learning versus, uh, I saw a great uh, a video of a, a girl who was six years old who was talking about trebuchets, which is an old medieval mm -hmm. siege weapon that would throw things. And, and when I was a kid, they didn't want to spend money on the books, so everything was a black and white drawing someone had done. This is a trebuchet, next page, everybody. Uh, where she 
had actually used one in a siege against the castle and she has an opinion. So at six years old, she's like, I hate trebuchets, they're so slow and they take ages to aim and they're just, you uh. see what I mean? And that changes everything. I mean, that they actually can think about it and, and it's analyze a more, it. It's uh, a more immersive experience, yeah, basically. It's, it, or it, it's, it's more experiential, yeah. basically, as opposed to a 2D sketch. Yeah, and if you add game elements to that, to make it so that they're, they feel they're progressing maybe to a goal, it's the kind of thing that I think they're going to learn a lot more than just looking at old black and white pictures like I did as a kid. So you don't worry about escapism, the, the escapism that games provide or the, that virtuality, virtual reality might provide. You're not worried about that. I'm you not worried about that. I, I think urge. the escapism is going to be incredibly valuable and yeah. it's going to help in many different ways. And um, it, what about Skynet? Do you think Skynet's going to take over or the singularity? Skynet has become self-aware. In one hour, it will initiate a massive nuclear attack on its enemy. Well, actually, I, I made a game on the Matrix years ago, so are we going to jack into the Matrix? <laughs> yeah, or <laughs> well, basically algorithms yeah. sort of running our lives. I don't it's know. It's a crazy I, question, I no, know, it's, but it's, it's not. Fun. It's not too crazy. I mean, uh, in reality, the speed at which things are improving, if you, if you study Ray Kurzweil's um, ideas of the singularity, for example, mm -hmm. making machines think better than humans, do you believe there won't be a computer that can think faster than this mushy piece of meat we have in our heads? Like, do you think that will never defeat that? We'll never make something <laughs> smarter than the human we brain? Will. We will. Yeah. And, and what will happen the year after that? It'll be twice as fast. Yeah. And twice as fast and twice as fast. So. And, and it becomes like we spend all these years trying to design a good hull for a boat so that we can quickly cut through water. Mm -hmm. When you have that kind of compute that's going to appear in the future, they can consider every possible option until they have the best hull for cutting through water. It will change a lot of the stuff that we were just, because of our own limitations, weren't really able to, to come up with the, the optimal solution to things. I, I think you're going to see that kind of compute is going to really change the world as we know it. But um, so I'm not it's not it's not something that you should worry about. It's something that's going to happen. And I think it's quite exciting. It's going to cause some really, really exciting things in the future. Well, they say that uh, or experts say that the alien life forms are more than likely synthetic <laughs> that we find or encounter yeah. will more than likely be synthetic, like an evolved computer brain or s something of that kind. We'll, we'll see. Uh, we'll see. It'll be the yep. computers that help us find them, right? right? It'll be the computers that help us work out how to go visit them. It's yep. like if we're ever going to travel through space, the distances are so vast. Yeah. Like to some extent, it's hard for our brains. I still, I still laugh when I read an article where someone's trying to tell you about gravity, because as humans, we cannot grasp what gravity is. And any article you read, they start talking about how you observe it. They just can't even take a stab at explaining why you aren't falling through that chair right now because you know th there's something pulling on you. It's fun right. to see human brains trying to, you know, we just accept magnetism and things like right. that because it's just there, but it's passing through a piece of wood. How? And you know, we can't make it. Um, you know, so there's there's a lot of things like that that I think maybe someday um, machines with greater intelligence than humans might be able to help us understand some of the things that we just take for granted.